When we think of space, we naturally think of the stars, solar systems, galaxies, the distant reaches of the universe. But space has another dimension to explore, not outward, but inward, into all the basic elements of everything there is on our planet. Here, a miniature world of space exists, a world filled with constant motion, one that went undetected for centuries. It is the world of the atom. Hello everyone, welcome back once again to the Free Radical Media Podcast. I'm here with my co-host as always, Patrick. Hey, what's up everybody? I am Eric Scott Picard, ESP, and uh, tonight we're going to talk about art. I'm actually very excited about tonight's podcast. Uh, we're going to talk about art as, you know, as... as as a medium for liberation, right? As a medium for uh, transcendent human experience. I mean, uh, I know these are big terms, right? But we're going to talk about art as just um, <clears throat> something that's uniquely human, u- uniquely experiential, u- uniquely liberating, which I think is the key here. Our guest tonight is Mark Henson. And before you do anything... I want you to uh, I want you to pause the podcast and I want you to go to markhensonart.com. Okay? Uh that's uh M A R K H E N S O N A R C A R T dot com. And I want you to uh open a new tab and take a look at his galleries. Take a look at the artwork that he has on display there. Don't even look at, uh, at any of the information about him. Just take a look at the artwork itself, because I think it speaks for itself. And uh, and then and then go back to the podcast, start playing it, and just take a look at some of this stuff, okay? While you're listening to what we say tonight. Mark, I'd like to welcome you to the podcast tonight. Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for having me on. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, share my uh, little bit about my life and my work with everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Mark, I want you to tell me a little bit about, um, hopefully, you know, everybody's going to get familiar with your artwork, um, but tell me a little bit about the mediums you work with. Tell me a little bit about, uh, tell me a little about the, about the themes you work with in your art? Well, um, when, when it comes to my materials and how I work, I'm pretty much of a traditional oil painter. Yeah. I like to, I like to emulate um, techniques used by, uh, I guess, what you'd call the old masters, um, painters of the past who I respect. And I think that the materials they use are pretty much tried and true. And uh, since uh, my pieces do take me a fair amount of time to create, I, w- I want them to stick around and last a few generations. So I'm actually pretty meticulous about my techniques and my desire to produce a work of art that's going to last and, uh, and, and keep its magic going on over a period of time. Theme-wise, I actually deal with a pretty big variety of, of uh, ideas from um, spiritual and metaphysical and, and meditative ideas. Uh, I also have a, a big range of works that I, I consider them, uh, I, I guess you'd call them eroticism in nature, mm-hmm. where, where I'm showing uh, human forms, uh, maybe in the form of trees or rocks or clouds, um, in, in positions of love making or embracing or, or hugging or, or just where nature loving itself is pretty much my theme as, and reflected in an anthropomorphic way. And I also have kind of a third area of emphasis, which is more of art work that relates to more of our time and place 
and um, deals with political issues and and political uh, or sociological problems that humanity is facing in our particular time in history. And those ones tend to be ones where I make some of my more, I guess, controversial statements uh, or, or, or display things that maybe some people find are not so beautiful or pleasant to look at, but I, I feel that the message is important that even if it's unpleasant, I still yeah. need to express it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. In your um, <clears throat> in your bio on your website, you mentioned that uh, you were as a, as as a youngster, you were exposed to um, some teachings in India. Would you care to elaborate on that at all? Well, it's kind of funny, really. I, I was, you know, just uh, I think I was in junior high school, or maybe my first year in high school, and I lived um, in Sacramento, capital of California, which is about a hundred miles from San Francisco, which was the capital of hippie fornia. <laughs> and, and, and back in the day, it was you know the head Ashbury was going uh, full blast, and out of there was a lot of little newspapers and underground comics and stuff. And one of the, one of the most well known and and widely read underground newspapers was called the San Francisco Oracle. And those issues, you know, people would somebody would go down to San Francisco and come back with a few, and we, we'd pass them around from person to person. The, every issue, probably a hundred people read it till it was in tatters. But anyway, one came across my hands that had an article in it about opening up your chakras by the mm -hmm. yogi master Swami Satchidananda, who was the founder of the San Francisco Yoga Institute way back when. Okay. And, and yoga is a big uh, fad right now, but actually it's been around a very long time in the U.S. And yeah. Satchidananda was one of the first Indian, real Indian gurus to come over and open a real teaching center here. And anyway, so he, they interviewed him in this article, and he actually gave, like, well, chakra number one, here's what you do. Chakra number two, here's what you do. Hmm. So I kind of looked at him, and I thought, well, third eye chakra makes sense. I'm a visually oriented person. Might as well give it a shot. So I followed his simple, easy-to-follow directions and had a little out-of-the-body, the, the, the door cracked a little bit, and some light leaked through. And it was enough to impress me that there was a, a, a more to life than we were taught. Mm -hmm. And and so I, you know, but the interesting thing about it, as any any practiced yogi will teach you, as you're getting close to the point of peacefulness and enlightenment, you get so excited about the whole thing, you fall back into your body and your thoughts, and you're caught back into the illusions of Maya again. Right. So, so yeah. although I got the teaser trailer of the full-on version, to get the full-on version was going to be a lot of work. Right. And yeah. So my, my first year or so uh, of, of after experiencing this, I, I you know, learned about yoga and, and, and hatha yoga, doing the asanas and meditating and, and those things. But I also, towards the end of that period, discovered LSD. And okay. And the LSD would kind of like get me there, you know. I guess it's the the, the white man's way or the, the quick version or or you know, enlightenment for dummies or something. But um, yeah, yeah, sure. It, it worked for me and and showed me that yeah that that, that I, I could actually get some knowledge out of this thing and it it filled my head with all kinds of crazy ideas that that I could translate into visual images. And that kind of like let me know I was on the right path and that I, I should follow that course, not necessarily doing a lot of psychedelics, but of trying to open my mind. And that's kind of what I did. And so my imagery started reflecting that. And uh, it was kind of fun because it sort of set me aside from the other students in my art classes, although some of them were doing the same thing. And yeah. uh, I just felt I was on the right path and, and felt good about what I was creating and felt validated at, at, that my, my thoughts and energies and actions w were going along the right way. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely interesting that you have, uh, I mean, at least to me, a lot of your art, especially a lot of your erotic art, has a very strong tantric sort of um, undertone to it. You know, absolutely, and, and, and it definitely without the overt use of you know tantric symbology, but just the idea of you know the 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 symbolism of the masculine and the feminine, and especially your portrayal of 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 nature as as like a as goddess, you know, as the goddess energy. It definitely it definitely is very apparent to me that you have a very strong inclination of that sort of understanding. 
Well, maybe that maybe part of that is uh, I come from a family where for a while I was outnumbered by the females. <laughs> <laughs> about about by two to one or more, and so if I didn't respect them and their ways, I was probably going to get you know uh, somebody's going to smack me. And <laughs> and actually, I love my sisters dearly, and and they w- luckily I've had a good enough relationship. <clears throat> excuse me, that that they could express themselves around me. So I got to know a little bit about how, how women were thinking and, you know, what made them happy and what, what offended them and such. And as I, you know, got into adolescence and started having some sexual experiences, and uh, my first sexual experience, I was I was high on LSD. And mm-hmm. so to me, that was a very romantic moment. And I think that um, most everyone in their life is looking for a, a, a sort of romantic moments on that level where you feel mm-hmm. you're at one with the cosmos and at one with the gods and goddesses and all of nature and all the animals and all your ancestors that were before and all of the future generations that are coming. There's, there's, there's this magical moment, and for me, it, it happened the first time. Hmm, that wow. kind of set the, that, that kind of set the bar for me. Yeah. Like, you know, I didn't yeah. really want to mess around with, you know, just, Hooking up with somebody at a party wasn't quite as satisfying. And, yeah. And so to me, you know, I realized, you know, just observing all other people and the psychology of humans around sexuality and eroticism, there's a lot of frustration and anger and jealousy and fear and lack of self confidence and all kinds of issues are associated around it. But to me, my most magical moments were in a natural, beautiful way. And so it, it also, you know, I, nature itself, is, this is what happens. Life goes on. Nature is in, in erotic action and the tantra is living all around you every moment. All the creatures in the world are busily reproducing themselves. Sure. And yeah. so having that awareness and the, the beauty of it made me feel that this was a special thing rather than something to uh, use to sell cars or clothes or yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I decided that for me, if my art is going to leave some any kind of impression or make some cultural changes or leave evidence of how we were thinking in this time as a culture for future generations, that I should do some uh, pictures that express my idea of that erotic wholeness with, um, with God and nature and the world and everything. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's it's uh, a couple of them are like really striking in the way you you subtly put it in but anyone that has any sort of knowledge of these ideas it, uh, it sort of speaks to you on on a conscious level but also like on a really deep subconscious level too you know um for example having sort of what appears to be like sperm ce- sperm cells spiraling around in, the, in a into uh, a galaxy into a galaxy yeah. you know just the depiction of like the mother goddess that's actually a point I'd like to bring up, Mark. Is that is that uh, in a lot of your erotic art, it's it's <clears throat> you're 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 putting together the microcosm and the macrocosm, right? You know, so so you you know, I mean, you've got the, like the physical act of lovemaking, right? Um, which is juxtaposed against the act of creation in the universe. Right, so you have essentially, I think, a, a big theme of your art, at least for me, just viewing it as a, you know, as as as, as somebody who's experiencing your art, is creation, right? It, it it's it's a theme of creation, you know, oh, uh, you know, how 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 do you take that? Well, well, you know, one of the big mysteries of life is is goes, breaks down into three questions, which is where are we come, where did we come from, <clears throat> what are we doing, and where are we going, mm. and and so the the where are we come from part, of course, the act of love making is is the the biological essence of it is to continue the species to keep life going on and keep life generating in the universe. A creative the, act, uh, yeah. It's it's one of those it's and the where do we come from, and and when you think about okay there's the biological side the sperm meets the egg and it forms a zygote and it, it the cells multiply and it turns into a little being and somehow that thing you know it gestates in the, in the with the mother and its egg or however it's coming out and turns into the next creature, 
But, uh, uh, but the mystery is, well, okay, so the cells do their thing, but it, it's a new life. And, and as, as babies and, and the animals, too, I believe, have consciousness as, as life forms come into the world, so does their consciousness at whatever level they exist. And where, do, where does that come from, the, the consciousness part? Is it something that, that some god far off in their, in their palace bestows upon each creature through an act of creation individually? Or is it something that, that it emanates throughout the universe like, <clears throat> like air in, on the planet and, and that, that, that it just nodes into beings from time to time, or maybe like how mycelium forms mushrooms? Uh, uh, you know that that's one of the mysteries that I don't think we're ever going to know the answer to, but it's going to it's going to continually fascinate humanity forever, I think, or any other conscious beings. Yeah. And for for me as an artist to to ponder that mystery is it's, it's like an endless source of of creative ideas. Do you think that um, <clears throat> that is in, in, indeed the role of the artist to take those concepts which no other being can really address? And uh, express them through some kind of creative pursuit. I mean, you know, it, it, it seems like the the unique role of the artist to do that. Well, it depends on what kind of art they they, they like to make. You know, the, the art art the word art covers a huge spectrum. Oh, absolutely, and, 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 and you know, of of course, we 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 could get into a two hour discussion about what art is, capital oh, A we, we, art, and, and what and what maybe it isn't too, and, and what it isn't. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, you're right. But, but for for me anyway, um, I guess well, as you probably know, the first time you probably tripped or even smoked a joint, you probably had a great experience and wanted to immediately go over and tell your best buddy, "Hey, guess what? This incredible thing happened, and I found out about this really cool thing going on, and I I just kind of share it with you." Yeah, yeah, sure. And b- back in the day, we called that the missionary complex. You, you just wanted to go out, you know, tune in, turn on, and drop out. Well, the the turn on part meant you wanted to share it with everybody you knew that, yeah. that of course you could trust with the knowledge and it's kind of the same way for me with with art and my messages i don't know if my messages are special or unique i think a lot of uh ideas get passed down through the generations of artists the, the same ideas come up over and over again and get expressed in uh, different forms but i think in some ways there's there's like a like an an idea bank out there somewhere, an idea library, and you can check out the book and read it and then come to your own thoughts about what it is and maybe write your own book. I, I kind of look at it like that. So what, you know, however unique my ideas are, the reason why I'm doing them is because I want to get people thinking to provoke their thoughts. And also <clears throat> because art, unlike music or dance, actually sticks around. Well, I guess music does if you record it. But, yeah. but in in a performance, you, you know, you experience it and then it's gone. And you've got the emotional impact and how wonderful it felt to to hear the music or see the dancers. But after that, it's a memory. With art, you can continue to go back and visit it. And and because of that, its static nature, it survives over time in a way. So when you go to an art museum and look at a painting from 400 years ago, if if you can stretch your consciousness back and get into the mind of that artist, you're actually communicating with somebody that's been dead for 400 years and yeah. feeling how they were feeling. And, and if you, especially if you are an artist, you can understand what they did to make that picture and how their brush strokes went down and see the drawing underneath and all that kind of stuff. It just gets you into their whole character. Yeah. And it, it's a magical experience in communicating with our ancestors. And for me, I want my pictures to stick around a little bit, so I'm hoping that the magic spells I'm weaving by creating the things will continue to emanate and and you know ripple throughout the pond long after I'm gone. I I, I you know I love how you use the term <coughs> magic spells when you talk about the creation of art, right? Um, because it's such uh, you know it's something that it really is beyond our understanding when it turn when it comes to the creation of something that's beautiful you know um it, it it really is magical to create something that somebody else will look at right a painting for example which somebody else will look at and have an emotional reaction to i mean that's a very magical idea 
because we don't really understand scientifically, you know, quote unquote, dispassionately, how that works. You know, when I look at a pony, a, a, a painting by Monet, for example, and I, you know, I, I, I've, you know, expressed this before. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Monet, um, and I see a little impressionism in your work, by the way. But um, <clears throat> when I see a painting by Monet, you know, I have this emotional reaction, right? And that's a very magical thing. You know, because this is a person who's been dead for however long. Um, it's it's an incredible it's an incredible experience engaging with art. It's uniquely human. It's a uniquely human experience. Well, I don't know. They say there's elephants that know how to paint. <laughs> well, you you know what? You're you're, you're right. And maybe I'm being species. Uh, maybe you know. Maybe I'm being species when I say this. You know. Well, I'm, 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 I'm being a little facetious myself. <laughs> you, um. you know, but honestly, there, there, there's a portion that I mean that 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 goes to show us that we really don't know what this is. You know, well, what, one of one of the one of the interesting things is, is is we do respond emotionally to images, as any news photographer can tell you, and how 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 does one imagine the emotion they want to evoke in their observer? Uh, how do you how do you place that emotion in a in a form that they can see on a piece of cloth or a piece of paper or a piece of film or something? How you, you, you how do you manipulate the mind of the person so that they catch a glimpse of what it is you're trying to express? That's that's part of each artist approaches that in a different kind of way and in their own way. And I think a lot of artists just don't even really think about that a lot. They just kind of do it intuitively or run off intuition well I'm going to make a picture and it's going to feel like this and they just do it and it does for me a lot of times because my pictures take a long time especially if they're a complicated theme or, or maybe on the subjects that aren't so pleasant I'm sort of like setting a stage when I paint the picture I've got to, I've got to create the scenery and figure out where on the stage all the actors and all the, all the pieces of scenery are going to go and then you know decide who the actors are and what they look like and their characters and personalities and place them in the scene. And so while I'm doing all of that in my mind, I'm kind of living out the stuff that I'm depicting them doing in my mind. I'm actually thinking I'm there in a kind of way. So if I'm doing a war scene or or something where where humans are mistreating each other, then my my empathetic side of me starts you know I start feeling it. And I know if I'm feeling it myself, if I if it's really strong for me, just painting the thing, that when somebody looks at it, some of that's going to come out for them too. So you're saying like the emotional the emotional expression that you put into the painting itself is going to come out in terms of the viewer. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You, you might think. Uh, imagine the song "While My Guitar Gently Weeps." Oh God, yeah. Uh, that kind right. of that kind of expresses it in a, in the musical sense. What I'm trying to convey here. Yeah. Mm. You know, and, and and you're right. Isn't that isn't that strange that we need to take um, <clears throat> that we need to express art in, in in terms of metaphors of other art, right? So we have to we have to take visual art and try to make a metaphor in terms of another art form, which is music, right, to describe art. There's no other way to describe art except in terms of art. I mean, that's, well, that's <laughs> how unique That's how unique the form is, you know, right? Well, we want to be able to see the music and hear the colors, right? Yeah, sure. yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I mean, even, 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 I mean, culture itself, I think, was a, a, at its crux as an art form. And I think this is what we, yeah. we really all need to wrap our heads around, especially in this turbulent time. You know, it, it, it's not about it's not about how many uh, how much land a certain empire owned, or how many people were conquered, or or you know the the the, the bullshit that goes on in politics. At its essence, a culture is defined by its art. Right. Well, when you when when you look at um, if you go to a, an art auction at Sotheby's or Butterfield's or one of the big auction houses, and one of those uh, Van Gogh paintings uh, gets knocked down for a hundred million dollars. Yeah. These are the most valuable objects on earth. Sure. Yeah. 
They're more valuable than gold and jewels and all the cars and castles. And when you consider the history of some of these artworks, the palaces that they were placed in are long gone, torn to the ground. The, the families that owned them are history 200 years ago died out. But, but somehow, when all the shit was going down, somebody said, hey, this stuff, we got to save it. Grab those paintings and hit them somewhere until all the troubles were over and then brought them back out again. They, mm -hmm. they were that valuable. The paintings themselves have survived, you know, the, the castles and the buildings that, were, that housed them. So to me, this is the heritage of humanity, and the sure. things we do consider most precious are our cultural relics. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Even, even going as far back as cave paintings. Oh, absolutely. You know, Ab well, that, that's right because it's the history of the the growth of human consciousness sure. that's expressed in these things. And until music, was, they were able to write down music. Um, it, you know, you can't really play a, a melody from ancient Egypt because they didn't have any way to note it down. Yeah, and, yeah. And so until so sound and and or how they danced or or any you know what what their drum beats were like or any of the other aspects of their culture. Mostly, what we have is the the physical artifacts they left behind in the form of artwork or, or objects. Sure. Yeah, uh, uh, it's reminiscent of your painting uh, New Pioneers with the, uh, the, yeah. the, 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 the wall painting. And then on one side is, I guess, the either the far distant past or the far distant future. <laughs> and then uh, on the uh, left side is, the, is our, our sort of ruined culture. Um, Probably, probably one of my favorite paintings of yours because it's just so there's just so many layers to it. It is such a beautiful painting. Yeah, that particular one. Let let me describe it a little for everybody that hasn't seen it. it and on the left hand side, it shows scenes of war and destruction where there's there, we're actually in the middle of a, some sort of a street battle while a city's in flames, and different uh, guerrilla army groups are, are duking it out in the street. And in the in the center of the painting. We have a, a line of, I guess you'd call them refugees, coming out of the war zone up onto a, a little ridge top, and uh, so they're sort of converging on this ridge top, and they're about to step over the ridge and descend into the valley on the other side. But, but in the middle of the ridge, there's a, there's an old old wall or rock or part of a ruin. It's got a tree growing in the middle at the top, and it's sort of forming the center between the destructive and positive sides of this picture. Yeah. And and so there's a there's a there's one of the refugees is standing in front of this this wall and on the wall I've covered it with graffiti and markings and artworks uh, hopefully representing all the different kinds of times and places and cultures the idea being that whoever passed this way left their mark so our our intrepid traveler here who's looking at this over he's he's a little bit like Diogenes with his lantern looking for the single honest man in the world yeah. he's got his lantern and his backpack and he's pausing on his journey to check out the 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 evidence of people who've passed by and then going down into the valley on the right hand side of the picture i have visualized in my mind how the world that we want to create for ourselves using technology that we already have so I'm, I'm, I have some buildings that I, in my mind, they're all solar powered. The, the siding of the buildings, the roofs and windows all are photovoltaically active. So the sunlight falling on any side of these buildings creates electricity to power them. <coughs> they're large buildings. They can house, you know, five or 10,000 people in a giant complex building. The yeah. idea being that everybody has a pleasant place to live and sleep and, and have, raise their family. But at the same time, because they're compactly housed in these comfortable buildings, to get outside is an elevator right away, and then you just hop on the uh, the loner bikes that are down in the lobby and go cruise out into beautiful nature, which is still intact. And I've created kind of a city area where you can see that, yes, these people, have, they live together and they're urbanized and they have a transportation corridor where, mm -hmm. you know, the electric vehicles and bicycles and electric trains can all use the same space to travel down. And there's a harbor with some ships, so they're engaging in commerce. And we show some terraced uh, agricultural fields where, where people are um, planting and harvesting crops. And the idea being that, um, yes, we can build our paradise, but of course it's going to take some work. But if we do this, we'll have a little spare time. So over on a hillside to the far right, I have a, a, a kind of a community picnic going on 
where I, I have people from hopefully all kinds of races and cultures sitting around in a big circle sharing their meal and their food and their stories with each other. Mm. I think at uh, Rootwire, yeah. I, I stared at this particular painting at least an hour straight, just staring at it. <laughs> I mean, it just really captured my imagination. And I no, think it's, that, it's a fantastic. And honestly, it did. It, 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 there's there's a decision there, isn't there? I mean, there, I mean, honestly, when you look at it, there's there's <clears throat> there's there's the idea of a decision, you know. Yes, yes, indeed. That's the whole point of the piece. Yeah, the, I wanted to show that that we as a as humanity we need to we need to make up our minds if we want to continue to exist in the world, or if we or if we want to just kill ourselves off. And a good example yeah. right now, existing right now in the world, is we could look at what's going on with the, the, the ISIS guys in Syria and and countries in Africa and places where people, for the silliest of reasons, are, are just killing each other right and left. And of course, you know, somebody's getting rich on the process, you know, prodding them along. There's somebody nobody, always nobody, getting rich. Isn't there? Yeah. But nobody's making them pull the triggers. They're doing it voluntarily. You know, it, you, somebody might sell them the guns, but nobody's making them pull the trigger. Some people want to live like that. Yeah. And and it, it, of course, causes hell for the rest of everybody else. So in this picture, you see the refugees coming up from there, and that's the key to the whole thing. If you look closely at the refugees, they're carrying their stuff. One person has their cooking gear. <clears throat> Perhaps she's going to set up a community kitchen. One guy's got his carpentry tools. Maybe he's going to build some houses for everybody. So they're taking their skills and what, what tools of their trades they can <clears throat> over, over the ridge to, to join with the people on the other side in building our new world. I tried really hard on, on the new world side to show things that we could build using technology that exists right now. I didn't want to be science fiction like, or well, in the future science is going to save us, or any of that kind of stuff. I wanted yeah, to know. Right, no, right, it's right. it's really a matter of just because I'm not, not sure that's true. Money. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, it, it, technology will help, but what really what it really is going to take is the desire to just quit killing each other and get on with building a world we can all live in. Yeah, exactly. I you know I, I, know, I think we, 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 we could do it in a high tech way, or we could do it with a horse and plow. But but yeah. we still need to get back to those ways one way or another. I, th I think what's going to save us is uh, human love and human desire and human passion. You know, I, I you know I think I think those things are going to save us and not uh, you know <clears throat> not 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 inhuman technology. You know, I think th that that can help. But I don't yeah, of course, of course it can help. But, but to, to think that we're going to wait around for some scientist to come up with a miracle cure that's going to feed the world, I think, I think that's silly. I think no, we exactly. need to get on with planting the gardens. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I, and, and I think this piece is so, you know, it, 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 it's so indicative of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's key because it's, it really shows you that I think at, at the core of it all, we need the vision, right? Mm -hmm. We need the vision of what we want to create. And I, I think that's so important. I think that's really a pivotal role of the artist, the visual artist, to 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 sort of put that vision out there, right? Like, I would be curious. It'd be curious. I'm curious to know, for example, ISIS. These ISIS guys, right? What kind of art do they dig? Right? Well, actually, they probably don't dig any art because they've been, uh, or at least the rumors are that they've been destroying um, the various mon monuments from Babylonian times that are hanging around over there. Right. Mm -hmm. And that they, you know, in the, the Quran, you know, it, it, I don't want to bad rap anybody's religious beliefs, sure. but there are parts of it where the, the graven images are not to be made. And by Absolutely, that they mean, yeah. they mean images of humans or animals or representing the divine or the prophet or any of those things. Absolutely. Are, are forbidden to, to create because because I think in their thinking that it's infringing on the realm of God. God's the creator. You shouldn't try to emulate him because that's disrespectful to try to like outdo God at creating something. And it, and we it could look, does we, we could look at the this. We, the, the theory holds true a little bit in modern times because we have uh, companies creating GMO 
food and want to like create mind control chips and stuff where they're maybe messing with God's creation. Perhaps the guys, the, the Muslims are right that maybe we shouldn't mess with these things, but I think depicting, uh, you know, gods and men and animals, I, I don't see any harm in that myself. No, I, 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 so, I don't either. I can, under, and, I can and, understand and, where the thought evolved from. And, yeah. and, and honestly, historically, I mean, it's led to some beautiful mosaics, for example. You know, oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Like, you know, you know, like Muslim art has been gorgeous in the world and it's contributed to the world. Um, I, I would love I would love someday to be able to visit Iran and see some of the mosques. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because they, they have they have they have created some very beautiful art, the Muslim, the Muslim world. But at the same time, uh, the fundamentalist aspect has restricted art to the point where I, you know, I, 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 I just simply can't agree, you know, uh, <clears throat> with. They, they, well, nowadays I don't know how those rules hold because they don't mind using a uh, a cell phone to capture a graven image. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> for, and, and for honestly, good or it, bad. it goes back to the, the Stanislav Zizek. Um, uh, you know, wrote about how uh, uh, the the ISIS folks are not true fundamentalists, and they, and I don't think they're true fundamentalists. Uh, you know, I, I you know I think it's honestly I think their fundamentalism is bullshit. I think their fundamentalism is nonsense. I think it's it's an excuse to rape and pillage and destroy. You know, well, probably, I, I you know, probably I most of the purely most probably destructive. I think most of the Muslims of the world would agree, um, yeah. having been having been to some of their countries. Uh, um, yes. uh, most of them just want to mind their own business and raise their kids and have a better life. Just like um, all of us do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think that's very true. You know, I think, but, this, but, I think but, this ISIS thing is 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 is, is bullshit. Well, there's always there. There's a story that I don't know five five percent or so of the people are psychopaths. Yeah, and yeah. Those those people are master manipulators, and somehow get the rest of the people going along with their programs. You know, we've had our George Bushes and Dick Cheneys, mm. so they've got their Ayatollahs and whoever's running their show. And why people want to follow these people that lead you down the path to perdition? I, I really that I, that's one of the mysteries that keeps me fascinated. Is what, why would humans follow a leader that would lead you to something that's no good for you? Right. Yeah. It should be mandatory that we make our leaders produce some form of art of what they want to produce. Either that or we somehow evolve our species hmm. so that we don't need to follow a leader but can just like work together instinctively. Yeah, somehow. there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I I agree. There should be some creative aspect, right? You know. And I, you know, I I I think that's so key, is that creative instinct, that creative aspect. Yeah, it, it definitely is funny when you look at any of these, you know, horrible regimes throughout history. None of them produced any form of art, and if they did, the art is drab, you know. And I, I think it's just very, it's it's it goes hand in hand. Any any culture that really produced a lot of culture, obviously, in my opinion, is is regarded as as uh, as something that was beneficial. In, in the human hit in the human story, and, you know, it's, it's it's like when uh, you know during the Stalinist regime, you know, you know Stalin was 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 <clears throat> dictating that you needed to produce this realist, you know, uh, art, when in fact, you know, the rest of the world was blooming with you know surrealism, modernism, you know. Well, there's there's another side to that coin, and that has to do in in the well modern art already was going on, but after the 40s when the CIA was created, mm -hmm. they actually sponsored artists like Jackson Pollock and some of the abstract expressionists. They thought that this art was so antithetical to what the Russians were trying to do that okay. if we could, if they could blow that up to become the cultural norm, that it would somehow subvert Russian society. The CIA actually did fund and sponsor a lot of cultural exchange and sponsored a lot of these artists who were creating this kind of stuff. 
so that they could actually use it as a wep- as a cultural weapon in the Cold War against Russia. And, and I, I can't really cite my references through memory here, but if you Google that up, CIA and modern art, you're going to find some really interesting articles about how the CIA used the modern art movement that was going on in New York in the 40s oh, and 50s okay. to, uh, as a weapon in the war. That's, wow. that, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. And I encourage people to do so, and I will do so. I will do so further, you know, especially because, you know, personally, uh, you know, full disclosure, I personally like, I, I, I love Jackson Pollock. I love that style. Oh, oh I'm not, I'm not, I'm not critiquing. No, the no, artwork. absolutely. They yeah. just, but they just felt that, that, that it was so, so, uh, that it, it somehow was so culturally strange, I guess, that it, that it would upset them. And um, I can believe that. I can, I, I, I can I kind of see, I can, well, it upset people here, too, a little bit, you know, the it, people that were the quote-unquote uh, art establishment, I guess, got all, but nowadays that kind of stuff is the established art, and art like what I do goes unrecognized, so it's, it's kind of the tables went the other way, eventually. Well, tonight your art is not going unrecognized, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> No, but if but you're not, you know, major museums don't really show the kind of art I do no. much unless I'm already dead or famous somehow previously. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's it's or galleries in the big city there that call themselves contemporary. They're interested in you know the blank canvas on the wall and why it's important. It's more important than than any kind of technical expertise or elaborate ideas uh, expressed uh, uh, that are that are narrative. And I and I totally that tell a story or have a yeah. theme. Especially because you're working in a form that's, um, you're working in, uh, essentially, and, 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 and tell me if this is untrue, you're working mostly on oil on canvas. These days, yeah. yes. When when I was younger, I experimented more with, with colored pencils and watercolor and pastels and such. But I, I, what I, the skill I really have is best for is, is oil painting is what I know how to use. Right, which which is a, which is a talent that is mostly um, it's it's a talent that's oftentimes you know considered passe amongst uh, modern modernist uh, artists today, right? So. Well, this this is this is true, and I actually follow a couple of different blogs um, that there are there are some artists who paint what you call representational art, and and they are always are discussing you know the vapidity of quote unquote contemporary art, or how there's nothing there. It's like the emperor's new clothes. You know, the okay, the idea that art is anything the artist wants it to be was expressed by Marcel Duchamp in 1912 or yeah. whatever. And nothing new has happened in the contemporary art world since the rest is just ways of trying to, to restate what he already said. And in a way, in my opinion, a lot of that is true. Although I, I can't appreciate that Jackson Pollock, I think a lot of what's called modern art is, uh, is well, in a couple hundred years, I, I don't think it's going to be around anymore, actually. Sure. I think I think people will not see why it was important, and it'll fall. I agree, away. although with you know people like Pollock, you know, to, to, you know, and, and and simply playing the devil's advocate as, as as a fan of Pollock, you know, I'll say that that was an important uh, point in artistic expression, where Pollock's work was very uh, important, but a lot of the derivative work was. Well, derivative. <laughs> well, it, it, exactly. Well, a, a, a good example of what I'm talking about, we, we, I was in London a year or so mm-hmm. ago, and we went to the Tate Modern uh, Gallery, which has, showcases a lot of the contemporary art of the world. And they had one big gallery room that had um, fluorescent light installations. Yeah. But this was kind of a fad in the late 60s and early 70s where people would go to the hardware store and buy fluorescent light fixtures and put them in different configurations in a room. And that would be the art. So this room was full of that kind of stuff. And it had kept my attention for about as long as it took me to walk from one door on one end of the room to the other. Um, Because I'd seen the stuff, you know, it's kind of a seen one, seen them all sort of thing. And there they were, a bunch of like fluorescent light fixtures on the floor and on the wall. And 
didn't really what was the point of that you know it already was lost to me when when maybe back in 1967 it was like the cool thing <clears throat> so and and a lot of this stuff I saw in that museum I felt the same way about and evidently everybody else did too because those rooms the, the people weren't lingering there to contemplate the objects the gallery that had all the surrealist and and uh, Dadaist art was the one where all the people were hanging out and actually taking the time to yeah, look at things. Yeah. Where the art had something more to say than just "Hey, I'm a I'm a fluorescent wall on, or a fluorescent light on the floor." Mm. Yeah, it's uh it's it's kind of interesting. I I like I like going to contemporary art shows and art fairs and stuff just to see what people are passing off as art these days. Um, but a lot of it, I think, isn't going to stand the test of time. I think I think that's the only judgment, isn't it? I mean, um, <clears throat> it's 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 not what we take of it. It's the test of time, which will actually decide what is high art, quote unquote, and low art, quote unquote, right? Which is which is another argument in and of itself, but. I mean, it, it, the, 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 that's what's going to uh, to decide that question. You know, you're you're doing work in in oils on canvas, which to me is incredibly modern and you know, um, incredibly timely, in a form that is supposed to be dead. You know, so i it's 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 impressive to me just on that on that level it because you've proven that that form is not dead right oh 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 no not at all i i i don't think so at all because there's there's a it a, it it there's a really big sensual pleasure in smearing around the colored goo <clears throat> on a piece of cloth until it turns magically into a beautiful vase exactly. of flowers with a little kid looking at it or exactly. whatever <laughs> or, or whatever or, or or a deer or, or or you know god looking back at you or whatever it is that comes out or even just the color smeared around just, just luscious colored goo like jackson pollock it doesn't really matter that there's a lot of fun in just taking that stuff and then messing with it till it looks good you know, it's kind of like little kids like to play with mud. It's that there's that instinct, and it's still there. And I think that people always are going to want to have things in their homes on their walls to look at. Yeah. They give them pleasant thoughts and emotions. Maybe someday it'll be giant video screens where the image change all the time. But uh, you know, when the power's out, what are they going to look yeah. at? So I think there's always going to be a place for painting. But uh, you know, it's funny. I, I think that uh, what what I guess the mainstream would consider quote unquote visionary art, right? And something like I don't know if you consider yourself a visionary artist, but something of 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 in the genre of um, Alex Gray or whatever. That particular kind of art, and especially with uh, your paintings, it's it's rousing. Right, like I look at I look at a painting of yours, and I'm hit on a very deep emotional level. Yeah. Right, and it it's not not only just because it's beautiful, but there's so much meaning behind it. A lot of it has a lot of religious undertone. A lot of it has a, a political undertone. But it's, you know, you're in my opinion. Now maybe I'm wrong, but to me, you're not just making art for art's sake. You're making art with a very distinct purpose in mind. And like you said earlier, almost like how a magician would concoct a magic spell, you're creating these art pieces to push your creative vision on the world and hopefully hoping it sticks. Well, really, I'm taking the shotgun approach. I'm doing it because it, it gets me off just to make the thing and say, wow, I actually could make that. That's exciting. It's exciting to see, have somebody look at it and go, wow, that's really cool. And then it's even more exciting to see, you know, somebody come up and they can cop their own story about what it's all about, or somebody comes up and they get what I'm trying to express. But I, I for me anyway, I'm, I'm besides just wanting to make something that's that's eye candy that that is visually exciting to look at. I'm, I also want to touch people in in an intellectual way, like like a writer would. That I, there's a story or a theme right. I'm trying to, yeah. to express, and I'm I'm not. I, I, my mind doesn't really think exactly like a storyteller. I'm not all that good at making up a story and keeping you entertained for hours with all the cool stuff that happens to all the characters in my brain. But I can take the time to do it all with colors on a piece of cloth. 
And so that, that somehow is where my special skill lies. But it's besides the touch, wanting to touch you emotionally with the emotional content of what I depict, I also want to make you, you think a little bit. You know, maybe you know, have some cultural references. Maybe you're going to want to go, maybe you see something in there that reminds you of another piece of art and you want to go look that up. Yeah, sure. You know, or, may, you know, or, or maybe you're looking at the new pioneers there and you're seeing the solar-powered buildings. It gets you intrigued. You go look at some solar construction. Sure. Type. I, 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 I basically want to get people, both touch them both emotionally and intellectually. It's, it's, because I can actually do that, I think that's what like gets me off the most about sure. it. Sure, yeah. And I, I think yeah. it's what separates you from a lot of quote-unquote contemporary artists, you know? And I, I think it's a shame that I know a local university um, uh, or a, a local art um, museum wouldn't uh, wouldn't accept Alex Gray. You know, he was just outside their boundary of what they considered art. They said some really unkind words about him and his stuff. And it's like, man, that's a shame because his yeah. stuff really has, you know. Which is unfortunate because I consider Alex Gray to be a genius. Oh, absolutely. You know? and, it, it, um, it's, and it's this whole genre. I think that I think the, the underlying meaning is what scares a lot of these people. It's, it's, it's a little too. I have a friend who's an art professor. And she does she does a variety of art, mostly along the surrealistic side. Of okay. It. But she talking to her is always fascinating because she lives in the world of what she calls academy, right. mm. and you know the yeah. academic universe. And she we've discussed art and what types of art and styles and types and what artists are doing. And the people in the academic world have their own ideas about what's important and don't really care about what the rest of everybody else thinks or feels about anything. So while they might completely think Alex, well, he doesn't really fit into the gamut of where the contemporary art movement is leading at this very time, he might not fit into what you know museum directors and art critics think is happening. But if you go to a, a big festival where Alex and Allison are painting live and there's 50,000 people, having an awesome sure. experience yeah. you know, with, the, with the music and the lights and the art and the, the slideshow and everything that's going on, it changes their lives. Sure. Those people go into a museum and look at those those fluorescent lights on the floor. It, it, they, it doesn't change sure. anything yeah. in their life. Who needs the art museum? Yeah, exactly. Who you needs know? that? So, so, so the, fact, the fact that Alex or any, any other powerful artist can arouse such such intensity among people alive and their their current audience. Most of those contemporary artists, I think, would be entirely jealous mm-hmm. of that. Except for maybe their pictures are selling for more money, so they don't. Care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I, I do have somewhere in my files. Alex had a show in New York or somewhere there where they gave him terrible yeah. reviews, <clears throat> and I, I I have that in my file somewhere just just to remind me of. Where we're at with these, well, people. yeah, with these people. That's the thing with these <laughs> fucking people, you know, where where it's the artists of a secondary importance to the money that can be made, right? You know. Right. Well, I think I think really really um, really good curators or museum directors or critics are actually looking for things that are trending in the world, the things that they see popping up kind of all over, that maybe maybe in general people all over the world or or like in the 60s, all of a sudden things were psychedelic all over. Every country had some kind of little psychedelic thing going on. It just kind of sprouted up all over at the same time. So how could you ignore that as a, as a social movement? And I think with art it's the same way. That, that, that art you see happening in people's lives every day might become the next thing rather than what somebody is concocting, um, you know, to please their college sure. professor, sure. <clears throat> or or what they think will please an art critic or or a gallery director. But I don't know. Art's also a commercial world in that in that part. There's there's a big commercial aspect. They want artists who can create uh, whatever they make rather quickly, so they have plenty of it to sell to their people. Somebody that spent two years on one painting, they're not going to be that interested in because they can't. A, they'd have to sell it for a really high price to make it worthwhile, yeah. and they can't they can't have you know a hundred of them in the back room to sell to the next buyers as soon as that guy's career takes mm. off. Right, it's at the mercy of the capitalist system at that point. A, a little bit, well, because our, the art business is a capitalist. Yeah, business. yeah. Well, you're right, <laughs> and, 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 and God, you know, that's that's 
something that's verboten to be saying to 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 be said. But that's a very radical idea, and it's incredibly yeah, cause, well. Com- com- in the in the commercial sense, the art world is one of the last great unregulated markets with big money in yeah. it. It uh, something that it, somebody could poop on a plate and it could be worth a hundred million dollars to somebody. That money changes hands. There's a huge economic shift has just happened over something that's essentially doesn't have any intrinsic value, so to speak. It's, it's you know you know it's not gold or it's not. Uh, doesn't necessarily represent a million hours, man hours of labor to create the thing, which money create represents man hours doing something. So, so art can be worth anything, and and because of that, its, it's value is flexible. It's more flexible than the stock market. It could be worth three bucks one day and three hundred million a week later. Yeah. And somebody could somebody could rake in that profit. Probably not the artist, but the guy that knows the guy that wants to pay three hundred right. million for right. it. He's going to sell it to them and keep all that money for himself. So there's there's the commercial side of the art world is is really kind of crazy. Which really brings us to uh, a piece that we're looking at right now. <clears throat> uh, a piece of yours called Venice of the North. You, you know, you're, uh-huh. you you recall the piece of I'm I'm sure. Oh, absolutely! I, I posted it on my um, Facebook page. <clears throat> just this last week to um, you know be in in solidarity with the folks marching and, in New and, York and and and, and God knows we are also in solidarity with those people marching in New York. I wish I could be with them now, um, but yes, absolutely. I mean, this is this this so, is an image of Wall Street. I mean, uh, describe it for us if you would. Well, we're at the corner of Broad Street and Wall Street in New York City, and you're on the steps of a federal bank that's catty corner from the New York Stock Exchange. And I, this is a post-global warming depiction where the New Yorkers have adapted to the fact that their city is now under 50 feet deeper water. So the water level is up to the second floor balcony part of the New York Stock Exchange. So the, the actual asphalt of the street is probably 20 feet below the surface of the water here in this picture. <clears throat> so New Yorkers are now a city much like Venice, because the actual streets are underwater, so everybody's getting around by by boat. So I've got you know some gondolas and little motor boats and putt putts and runabouts and stuff, so the people can come and go doing their daily stuff. And I, I tried to depict it like the people are no longer so worried about global warming; they've somehow accommodated themselves to it. But what what you're seeing is the New York Stock Exchange underwater, essentially, and the front of it's kind of converted to a public market. It might not be the stock exchange anymore, even though it's the building. Yeah. People are people are vending. There's a flower shop out front, and people are coming and going with their purchases from inside. And boats are lined up outside, you know. And there's there's a sidewalk cafe, and so I, I tried to make it look a little bit like Venice in the background. I made a, a Venice-like bridge between a couple of the skyscrapers, so people could walk across the street without getting wet. <laughs> and uh, it, it, so it's kind of a, a, a friendly, sarcastic dig at the idea of global warming. Yeah. And the thought that maybe big business will recognize the problem when they have to take a boat to get to work. Right. Yeah. And and it's a beautiful piece, uh, just to further describe it for people. Um <clears throat> technically there there's definitely a level of, you know, impressionism here, um, in the reflection of the water. Um there's an eye effect that's created by the arch. Um it's 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 a beautiful piece, Venice of the North. If you, if you want to take a look at it in the galleries, it's a very beautiful piece. Um, but it, you know, inherently, there's a lot of realism here, um, just on a technical level. But it's it, well, I actually I actually did go online to get photos of the street there since I wasn't in New York personally to to look at it or take pictures myself. I went online in a bunch of different places to get pictures of the buildings that were there on the street so I could depict them pretty much out. Well, I mean, you did very well. I mean, I've been on this street myself, you know, and I mean, like, I've seen these buildings. You did a very fucking, yeah, a very fine job. Um, yeah. <laughs> You'll have to edit that. <laughs> <laughs> we're allowed to oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, oh, we, you're allowed. Okay. We can say whatever we want to say. <laughs> <laughs> But um, 
but yeah, you you did a gorgeous job here in this piece, and this is one of my favorite of what I've seen of, of, of your work. I mean, it's just it's it's fantastic, just on a technical level and just on a on a uh, <clears throat> on a uh, philosophical level. I mean, it's 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 excellently done. Yeah, I think every person marching uh, for climate change should should take a really deep look at this painting. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and, and for you know anti-capitalist change, because I know that many of us are there for that reason too. You know, and I think uh, I think everybody should take a look at this piece because this is very timely. Um, Venice of the North is very timely and very, you know, poignant, I think. You know, I think a lot of your work is poignant, Mark. I, I mean, I think, I, I, you know, I think it's very timely. Well, I, I, I tried, I, one of the things I try to do is uh, a lot of my pictures don't have a lot of references to, to uh, cultural things. Sure. In particular, where the idea that somebody from any time or place could look at the piece and get something out of it has always had a special appeal for me. So a lot of my pieces, I don't put, say, clothing or particular styles on my figures, so nobody can say, well, that's from the 50s or something. That I want them to be recognized as humans even in a thousand years if you live in Timbuktu. So I, a lot of my pieces have that, but my political ones, uh, some of them are more topical and to this time and place, and that, that one in particular is one of those. I did a companion piece to it called uh, uh, Sunset on the Potomac, where mm. you're looking from the Washington Monument towards the U.S. Capitol, and it's all underwater with a couple of solar-powered boats cruising by, and uh a couple are camped out on the island, which now surrounds the Washington Monument, and they got their little tent up, and, and they're catching fish there from the monument um, for their dinner. And and off in the distance over the water, you see the Capitol. Wow. And I, with both of those pictures, I went on I went on Google Earth, where you can kind of set your point of view of the camera to a different altitude. Okay. So I set I set my point of view for about 50 feet above sea level today and cruised around to see you know where how things would look, and to get references for both of those pictures. Huh. Sure, sure. Kind of like the the post-apocalyptic, uh, you know, view. Yeah, or, or I don't know about apocalyptic, but post post oceans rising. Sure. Anyway. No, I'm looking at uh, sunset on the Potomac right now. It's a, it's a very beautiful piece. You know. And I'll actually, I'll sync these images up along with the video too, so they come up as we're talking about them, so it'll make it a little bit easier on the on the viewer or the listener. Yeah, I, I sort of imagine you guys sure. would do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. And, and, and that's not to say, I mean, there's a wealth of, of very beautiful fucking images um, there for you to see uh, at Mark's website in the galleries. Beautiful images. I might I might do some more based on the theme of global warming. I've, I've thought about you know trying to you know other famous cities perhaps what happens when the when the water is too high. It, it, I mean it's definitely needed. And you know on the way right. um, over to where we record, me and Eric were talking and we said you know even it really seems like all the factors are in place, especially within this past summer, within the past couple months. You know we have the the, the horrific things going on in the Middle East. We have uh, the Ebola virus really picking up in Africa. We have climate change not slowing down. And it's like, how do we put the brakes on this thing? You know? Yeah. And um, we both kind of came to the conclusion, uh, you know, art. Art is really, I think, the most fundamental way we could put an end to this. Um, even way Even more so than... Um, protesting and writing to our congressmen and all of that. I mean, I think it's useful to a degree, but I think we, this 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 um, trajectory we're sort of locked in has so much momentum to it that on a fundamental level, the only way we can really transform things is through the artistic process. Well, one uh, one one idea I've held on to for, for a long time is that. Um, <clears throat> If we're busy being creative, then we're not busy fighting and killing each other. Sure. Yeah. 
and that and that and that violence and violent behavior is often the result of frustrated creativity. Uh, you know, Hitler wanted to be an artist, mm. and he he wasn't all that good. But rejection didn't sit very well with him, and look what happened. Well, mm. And and who knows? Maybe some of the people that rejected his art were Jews. Maybe that was the the seed of of, of the whole thing with with Hit, the Nazis and the Jews was maybe because Hitler felt rejected by a Jewish professor. Sure. Yeah. I don't I don't I don't really know the exactly that might may or may not be true. But but the idea that if if People are being creative. They don't. They don't. That's it. Occupies them from from negative thoughts. <laughs> and a, another thought along those lines is that, as as in terms of the the capitalist culture and consumer culture, is that instead we we've been inculcated <clears throat> the last fifty or hundred years that we should we should buy and consume more stuff. And and the reason why, of course, is that the Waltons are going to get richer if we're you know stocking up at Walmart every weekend. And and instead of having more stuff, we can have better stuff. You know, we don't have to make more. We could just improve on the things we have. We could make our world beautiful. Right. When I, I spent a lot of time when I was younger on, on, in Indonesia on the island of Bali. And one of the things that I really loved about their culture was that they didn't need a lot of things, you know, massive possessions. The possessions they did have, though, they, they they knew how to make them beautiful. Even everyday objects would be all decorated and designed nicely, and they'd spend their time, take their time making the things, putting putting love into all the stuff they created. And it, so it, their cult, their 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 island is rich in culture and beauty, to the point where it became a tourist mecca, which maybe is the curse of the place. But um, the idea that in, instead of having you know three cars in the garage, why don't we have a really beautiful, nice art car in the garage? <laughs> sure, yeah. And that our time that we spend, you know, people need to be occupied. They need work. They need something they can do <clears throat> that hopefully they're paid for, so they can you know pay the bills, keep their family fed, and everything. So instead of just making more stuff, you know, if we had we had, you know. People were hired to like make over our buildings so that they're beautiful and comfortable, or create gardens all along the streets, or, or all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, you know, Republicans think, that, well, that's just make work projects or socialism. But to me, spending the money we spend uh, to get people rich by making bombs and uh, you know they're blowing things up, and the money all goes to one capitalist seems kind of dumb when the money could be passed around to thousands of workers who are working every day to make our cities. Absolutely. Up. Yeah. And and like you, you said previously, you know, I, I definitely do think it's a sort of um, a sort of stunted sexual process that results in a lot of these um, violent or destructive cultural um endeavors that we've the the whole world seems to be partaking in um i'm not i'm not sure if you're familiar with the psychologist Wil, wilhelm reich hmm. and yeah. you know that was his whole notion that uh you know like nazi germany was just that it was a repressed sex drive that sort of manifested in that horrific period of history and i, hmm. I really do think you know how you sort of segregate your your art between eroticism and politics it they're really all I think part of the same current, you know. To have a healthy understanding and uh, un understanding of one's sexuality results in less political issues. Well, one one of the reasons I think that Muslim fundamentalism or the, the the psychology that today manifests itself as Muslim fundamentalism has to do with the fact that there that these men are afraid of women having any kind of sure, power. Yeah. And because because they see what happens in the West where women have some power and they think, well we can't get away with the stuff we're always doing. <clears throat> it's it's gonna be trouble. We don't want this. And I, I think that that the empowerment of women I think is actually <clears throat> the next step in human evolution that we're treating each other as brothers and sisters rather than as master and slave and uh, that I think will make a big difference and and I think that those cultures it's like the last gasp of of the the, the pre pre equality era is is these people thinking that, that we need to go back to how things were we need to keep these people under control we need to sure. subjugate women and yeah. and i think all all of those those masculine religions are afraid that, that the power of women might cause changes that disrupts whatever it is they think they're getting what a great 
I, I, I personally don't see what they're getting out of it at all. I, I have a much better time when me and my women friends are all in the same room and we're happy together rather than, yeah. you know, them sitting across the way in a, with a bag over their head. To me, that's yeah, not absolutely. Fun at all. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and like, honestly, what a great, what, you know, what a great term pre equality era. I think, I think you're right. I think we are in the pre equality era. I think we're in the era where we are attempting to achieve equality, right? You know, but we're not there yet, you know. And and, and, and in terms of feminism, I mean, God, of course we're not there yet, you know. Well, what it really is is recognizing the the worth of each individual, regardless of what sex they are. That they that that they're a human being and deserve to be treated Absolutely. like one, and have have you know opportunities just like anybody else for education or however they want to live their life. They, everybody should have at least a, 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 a equal shot. You know, we're not all going to be equal because we're you know people have different amounts of intelligence and physical strength and how you look and all that kind of stuff. We're all different, but but everybody there is is sort of a level playing field in that. You know, if you want to do something, you should at least have the opportunity to get the the skills and education needed to pursue what you want to is you want to do. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Mark, we're coming to the part of the show which I most regret, which is the portion of the time that we have to stop talking about these things. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's about time for me to cook the um, dinner here. But, uh, I mean, uh, I we're, mean, look, we're we, a few we hours did, later we than did you out here. coined the term pre equality era, which I honestly am probably going to use in future shows. Trademarked by Free Radical. Oh, all right. Yeah, trademarked, <laughs> bam, there it is. <laughs> um, feel free, feel free. <laughs> um, but why don't you tell us about where people can contact you, where people can see your art? Okay, I have um, I have a fairly I don't know about sophisticated, but it, it at least it works, and you can see my stuff there. Regular website mm-hmm. on the World Wide Web, and you can get me there at http colon slash slash markhensonart dot com, all one word m a r k h e n s o n a r t dot com, and if you have any trouble with that, you can Google it if you spell my name right, and that is just like the Muppets. You know, imagine Kermit <laughs> and his pals and their daddy, <laughs> Mr. Jim Henson, who I'm not related to, but we spell our name the same. Well, there you go. And I also have um, some Facebook pages, and one of is is uh, Mark Henson, just my name. There's my first friend page is Mark Henson. My fan page is also Mark Henson, where you can like me. And without going through the rigmarole of trying to be my friend and listen to posts and all that stuff. And then I have a second friend page because my first one got filled up too much, which is Mark Henson slash art. So if you actually want to friend me and open a correspondence with me, that's the place to do it because the first one is full up. And in, 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 in any case, if you go to the Facebook pages, you can find the other ones because I have links on each one to the others. Great. But if you want to see all of my work and learn a little bit more about me history-wise, um, my regular web page is the place to do it. Well, Mark, it's it's it's, it's been fantastic, and I've I've really loved this conversation tonight. I really have. Oh, oh one more plug. Yeah. And if you like what you see and want to buy stuff on the web page, is where to do it. Or just give me a call and we can chat. Great. And 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 most certainly do that. Most certainly do that because it's it's beautiful work. It's beautiful. Bye.